there are a lot of perplexing elements about being human. And probably the most continuingly difficult aspect is dealing with what we call otherness or others. I often say there is no perfect fit between people. Mostly we are in some way uncomfortable with others. The only thing that gets us, gets us over that discomfort is this strange, inexplicable, indescribable thing called love. It gets us over the barriers, it gets us through the obstacles, it makes it possible for us to survive in a world of deep alienation, really. We don't tend to trust others, we tend to judge them, we tend to feel superior to or inferior to them. We don't always have their best interests at heart and we don't believe they have our best interests at heart. We want to reshape them into the mold that we think we are. It's really complicated. And for many people it's the entirety of their life. How to deal with the otherness, the otherness of their own parents, of their own siblings, of their marriage partner. And you think if you discard one other, you'll get a different, better other, but you never do. You just get a different other, something else, something that you haven't dealt with before. You may even get excited thinking, well, this will be a good, good challenge, and then it proves not to be. Because otherness keeps bringing us to this place of alienation. But when we love someone, it obscures all the boundaries. It obscures the difficulties. It doesn't obliterate them, but it makes it possible to maintain a real and valuable and engaging connectivity to another human being. Let me also add that otherness is not simply directed at people outside of you. Perhaps one of the most profound others is our own self. How did I become this? What am I? Who am I? How do I live with this condition? How did I become six foot four and four hundred pounds? How did I become this tiny little innocuous thing that walks around the world with a limp on one foot and uh, <clears throat> endless headaches. How did I become this? Whatever your thing is, believe me, I've heard everybody's thing. Or probably not, but I can imagine. How did I become this other trying now to relate to still another other? Where is the alignment? How do you take this alienated persona and relate it to another alienated persona. Again, again, the answer is love. And where does that come from? Where does love come from? Well, if you want to talk about mysteries, that's the big one. And I've talked about this a lot in the class about how does brute force, matter, iron, metal, cosmic dust, how does that produce love? I saw a line yesterday that Maya Angelou wrote saying, maybe it's love that holds all that stuff together. Maybe it's the basis for everything. Maybe it's the thing in which matter actually finds itself forming.
maybe it all comes out of love. Or that cohesive force of love or magnetism that pulls things together. What is it? I don't think we're ever going to understand exactly what it is, but I think we are going to, at certain moments in life, if we're lucky, feel what it is. It doesn't mean the mind will be able to go, oh, I figured that one out. You'll just know, oh, I feel this thing. I feel this thing. I care about. I empathize with. I feel drawn to. I feel a commonality with or a oneness with another, an other being. And even more kind of remarkably, maybe your own alienated otherness may find this place inside that loves you, that just loves you. And if you go deep enough into that, you may discover <laughs> hey, it doesn't love you, it is you. This is who you are. This strange, inexplicable force that simply is, that is unaccountable in any intellectual grasp, it just simply precedes everything. And yet, it is possible to be born from that, to have it surrounding you, to have it totally oceanically being inside you, and not to be aware of it. To actually live in the world like gross matter, fearing otherness, alienated from yourself, living in this place of total, unending discomfort. Completely caught by the physical and not aware of the metaphysical. Dealing with what you call the natural and not aware of the supernatural. I would venture to say almost everybody lives in the materialistic, manifested reality of their life without even questioning for a minute how or why. All they know is, give me Tylenol, give me whatever it is that will get me through the day, Xanax, Valium, give me the thing that will help me get through a lot of sex, a lot of whatever your thing is, and just like make it possible to find the pleasure in it. Maybe if I jump off mountains with some kind of strange wing suit and fly to the bottom, I will find the reason for being. <coughs> maybe. Maybe. You can try all that stuff. If I marry this person, have an affair with that person, do this, do that, then it will all come into focus. I mean, the world has been trying all that from the beginning of time. It tries everything. Everything. And what works? What works? Have you found anything that works? Well, you know, Buddha said life is suffering. Sartre said hell is other people. What are you going to find here that's going to take care of this? What are you going to find in this manifested state that will make it worthwhile? Well, like I always say, we incarnate for two things. One is love. Two is ice cream. Three, sex, but sex creates its own problems, as we all know. You can't get enough of it. It only delivers sometimes. When it doesn't deliver, you go crazy. It's, you know, ice cream's reliable. <laughs> love is somewhat reliable. And the rest is all up in the air. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, Buddha tried something really interesting. He decided to let go of everything, all of his attachment to everything. He let go of his palace, his parents, his life of <coughs> comfort and well-being. And he went into the woods and he sat under trees, 
ultimately a bow tree, but he sat under lots of trees and he shivered and he baked and he gave up food and he, and he suffered and he meditated and he just sat there and said, I don't want to move until I get it. Until I get it. He tried every austerity possible and, and in the end, in the end, he got it. But he said, what you get is what was always there what was always there. And he prescribed a kind of middle path without extremities, without austerities, a simple way of being, just being you in your life. And that, that in a way, is enough. But of course, it's really, in a sense, not enough because very few people are in their life, just living the middle path. Most people are in a state of profound distraction. Profound distraction. Distracted by what? What they want, what they wish for, what they wish they had gotten, what they wish they hadn't gotten, what was not appropriate, wanting to find something in the other, wanting to find something in themselves, everything but what is. There is always this pursuit of something that's future or past, resolution or irre irresolute, something that the future will deliver that you will never arrive at because the future never exists. Only this exists. Only this is. Only this minute is real. With all of its alienation, with all of its otherness, with all of its strangeness, this is what is. And if you are trying to find peace and joy and contentment and all of those things, and you're looking down the road, you're not going to get there. If you're looking to resolve what was in the past or should have been or how it might have been, you're not going to get there. The only way to get there is in this very strange, imperfect reality that you're in right now. Right now. I mean it. Right this very second. This is the only place salvation resides. This is it. This is it. And if you are trying to look anywhere else, you're going to find yourself struggling and miserable and unhappy forever. You have to stop at some point and go, this. And you have to say yes to it. You have to accept it exactly as it is. And it will appear imperfect and other. How do I embrace the otherness of my, re of my reality, of my truth? The strangeness of it, the bizarre lack of satisfaction, the fact that it has happiness and sadness almost in mixed measure, the fact that it promises so much but right at the moment doesn't seem to deliver. That makes you look elsewhere, but no, don't do that. Don't go elsewhere. Sit here. Be here. Figure it out now. And it's not figuring, it's really residing. Reside in this strange mixture of you. Sit in it, bathe in it, wash in it, let it cleanse you. Once you sit and embrace the what is of your life, once you embrace this, something starts to happen. First of all, you discover you have a skill, and that skill is to sit in the midst of everything in a one-pointed, quiet, non-judgmental, and allowing way. You just go, okay, okay, I accept. That's called surrender. I accept. This is what is. As you start to do that, the part of you that's trying to figure things out, that's frustrated with and alienated from the world, gets quiet. It just quiets down. And as it gets quiet, something else happens. You just start to go, okie doke, okay, I'll accept this, accept. And as that acceptance takes place, the voice of non-acceptance begins to lighten and even kind of evaporate. And then there you are, sitting in this alienated, uncomfortable state, but you're not alienated or uncomfortable. You're going, huh, wow. You're not even really going wow because there's no one to go wow. There's just being in that state. You're just there. 
You just are. And there's nothing judging it or equating it to anything else. There's nothing saying it should have been or would have been or could be or might be. Nothing, none of that. You're just there. And as you sit in that space, there seems to be a force that begins to kind of both go deep. It kind of goes down, 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 down into this bigger, 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 bigger space. And it also gets lighter and lighter, so it kind of opens and floats beyond it. And it becomes expansive and vast and encompassing. And the whole known universe, everything you've ever known that's truly other, dissolves in it. Every thought you ever had goes away. You're just there. And this thing just expands and deepens simultaneously into the space of what can only be described, if there's any word at all, as a mixture of love and ice cream. It's so simple and delicious. It's so you. It's who you are. It's what you are. Everything else is just whatever it is. But because you're no longer there judging it or wishing it to be other or seeking anything, because there's nothing better than this. Nothing better than this. Great sex implies what this is. Ice cream gives you a hint of it. This is, this is what it is. And it's yours. And not only, again, is it yours, it's you. This is what you are. This is what we collectively are. And of course, when you really dive deep into this, what's so beautiful about it is that you realize everyone comes from here. It's not you who comes from here. We all come from here. So all of that otherness that you have such a hard time relating to is all resolved in this place of unbelievable love. Beautiful, sweet love. It may go beyond that. It may go into a place that some people describe as nothingness. There is a sense of that, that it's nothing and meaningless. But I will tell you, you must pass through the most beautiful awareness of love and being to get there. It's a little bit like going to bed at night, on a good night, I watched my son, my grandson Elijah last night go to bed and he had a smile on his face, he grabbed his little rabbit, he had a level of joy in him that I just, I just relished, I just looked at it and that was love and comfort and joy and then he went within seconds into nothingness. The love, the comfort, the joy, the embrace were the doorway to nothingness. So we should trust that, we should trust it. This is the journey. This is the journey. You can't get there without sitting still. You can't. Without bringing yourself to that place. You can't think your way into this. You can't be creative and find your way into it, except creativity creates a kind of timelessness that is a potential doorway. Work, day-to-day, eight-hour work, if you really enter into it, also can become timeless, mindless. You just do it, and in the doing you become being, and the being can take you there. But if you're not conscious of what this process is, it'll happen and you won't know how it happened or what to do about it. How do I get back to it? Well, you may think I have to just go back and do the factory work, or you have to go for your walk, or you have to do something. You don't really have to do anything. But that, in the manifested state of our reality, there is doing. And you have to kind of do something, and the simplest thing you can do is sit still and watch it. You will have to deal with the craziness of your mind. And that will take your attention for a period of time. And for people who don't have enough time to give it, that may just become the distracting factor, and you'll say, I can't do it. It's too hard. I can't sit still. I cannot do it. Give me a valley. You know, and whatever it is you say. The work of spiritual development, I hate to use those terms, the work of being happy is let go of your mind. Letting go of your mind is an effort. I got a wonderful email from a man I never met the other day who came across me online. And he had this beautiful way of putting it. He said, I've always been a weekend warrior. I would 
do this meditation and do all this two days a week. He said, and then suddenly he said, I became, I was called to active duty. And I'm now 24 7. This is no longer a weekend practice, it's all I do. And that's kind of it, guys. It's when does that happen? When do you go from being twice a week or once a week or whatever your thing is to an you know, occasional, I'll try this again, to this is it. This is why I'm here. This is what I care for and care about. I'll tell you, kind of what begins to make that take place is when you've done it, even through your weekend warring enough, that you start to go, nothing in the world nurtures me, fulfills me, satisfies me as deeply as those moments where I just sit still. And whatever it is that I get from that, I need to keep that alive all day and all night. And it's, I know there's a you in that, and that's always the problem. You know, the you, the ego mind that wants that. Actually, it needs to be, it needs to be broken down and ultimately dismissed. But it's your friend right now. The ego mind that wants this is your friend. Listen to it. Let it bring you to the battlefield. Let it get you engaged. Let it do all this. Ultimately, I will promise you this, it will be beaten to a pulp. And you will let it go. Or you will just say, thank you for all of your help. You've done it. Goodbye. Or the best version of that is it just leaves the scene. And there you are, as you are. I've spent a week, with a few days actually, with my family in Atlanta, my sister and her family, and <clears throat> a dear friend who just got through heart surgery, open heart surgery, and seeing a production of Ghost, kind of a triumvirate, the things that brought me to Atlanta. <clears throat> the lessons I learned there are everything I'm talking about. I love my family, and, and my family, especially in Atlanta, for reasons I don't understand, loves me. And they go out of their way to to be with me. They took the, one of their one of them took their child out of school so we could have lunch together. Uh, and they are the biggest hearted group of people you can possibly imagine. And I got there, and and my sister and I have a connection that is like pre this world. We just we know we were we were in the same family for each other, not just. For no other reason, really. We were there because we reflect everything I'm talking about here. She is exceedingly connected to herself. But she's also, like all of us, full of issues, full of dramas that take place around her. She had five children. Every one of those children had their issues. All Now they're grandchildren, now there are grandchildren, and they have their issues. And, <clears throat> and I walked into the middle of all that. Just issues everywhere, <laughs> flying all over the place. And I couldn't believe how, how, how complicated all of our lives are. Everybody's life. And they're such big issues that ultimately, you know, you go, how are they going to get by? What are they going to do with all of this stuff? And I'm not going to, you know, betray all their confidences, but I'm telling you, heavy duty stuff all across the board. And the one thing they all have, which is phenomenal in my mind, is they are all loving, deeply loving. Loving of one another, loving of others. They are <clears throat> so loving that they're easy to love. And when we get together, we hear our stories, we do all the stuff, but we don't care. We just go into the embrace. And it is my idea of perfect life. It's what life can be. Yes, we have our dramas, and yes, we have awful stuff going on. Everybody does. But we have this containment of caring for one another that is so beautiful. And it is a kind of genetic thing in this family, I think. I don't know where it comes from. Lineage, maybe my grandmother, my Russian grandmother. <clears throat> I don't know where it comes from, but I know it fills out. And it shows me what life can be. And it also shows me what life rarely is. Because I look at so many people and their families and their stories and their histories and they do not contain love. They do not contain ease on any level. 
And all I can do is empathize so deeply with what that is to have a life absent love and caring, especially when you're young. Some people fight because of that absence to create it in their life or to find it in themselves, and some people are remarkable in that journey. And it's an extraordinary thing to see that happen, really extraordinary. But mostly what I see is sort of the biblical idea <clears throat> that the sins of the fathers go to the seventh generation because it's so hard to break out of. If you come out of no love, you will create no love, you, or you will live in no love. If your life is full of suffering, you will project suffering. It just goes on and on and on. And what can finally free you from that? What can free you? Well, I think there's a breaking point in suffering that says, I can't do it anymore. And that's called surrender. I think there is a moment where you say, God help me. I think there is something that says, I want what they have. Meaning the contentment, not the stuff. Something can happen in suffering that f begins the journey we're talking about here. <clears throat> the journey of ultimately finding stillness inside and acceptance. It's so powerful. <clears throat> it's so necessary. <coughs> and I keep looking in people's faces and go, when will you find that? Because most people have just enough suffering to make it bearable. And they just live in that state for a lifetime. And then probably come back and live it again and live it again for seven generations. It either has to get so bad that you finally make a choice for it to be otherwise, or you slowly, out of some level of intelligence or spiritual curiosity, you start to work your way out of that stuff. You start to work your way through the world into an awareness. And if you're listening to this talk right now, you're one of those people who've done that. Somehow you've arrived at a place of listening to this stuff. And all I want to tell you is, you're there, do the work, and the work means nothing else but accept this. Accept this. Say yes to it. Trust it. My sister and I have a very similar language, and we talk about, and I think I've talked about it here, the the mush of life, or the soup of life. It's all these flavors mixed together, even bitter and salty and sweet. It's got all of this stuff. It's all kind of mixed together, and it's what it is. It's not all sweet. It's not all sour. It's not all bitter. It's this thing. And, and certain flavors rise depending upon where your tongue is and where it hits your tongue and how, how it goes into your system. And, and you want to go lean toward one, but the other one makes you kind of lean away. But on the other hand, the negative flavor actually makes you love the better flavor, the sweeter flavor, the spicier flavor. And we're all that every day. And settle into the mush. Be mush. Feel it. The mush is the beginning of the unmanifested state of being. Manifestation is sweet, sour, bitter, spicy, you know, that's manifest. Mush is all of it together. And it's the beginning of realizing that it all has comes from something really simple, which is inexplicable and mysterious. Finding your way into now, into this, takes one thing. You realize you're now and have always been on the front lines of your life. You're not in the background. Life is not happening out there and you're somewhere else safe and protected. You are on the front line of your own life. You're an, an active service. This is real. This is not a 
This is not an illusion. Well, it is, but it isn't. <laughs> this is your dream. This is your illusion. You've got to do battle in the front line. If you're sitting in the background letting other people fight your battles and do the war, one day you're going to realize it's yours. It's your battle. And the only battlefield is right here. So I can give you a lot of metaphors for this battlefield, for whatever you want to call it, but it's daily life. How you deal with your daily life. Do you go, do you, do you deaden yourself to it? Do you hide from it? Do you run from it? Or do you come to the battlefield? You know, most of us are afraid of battlefields for good reason. And it used to be an ancient time that we were all in battlefields. We were always on the front lines of danger. Always. You know, there was always something outside the cave waiting to get us. There were always other tribes wanting what we had. There was always danger. We have created an unbelievable world where there's very little immediate danger. And we can hide in that space. Amazingly, most people in the world of no danger are more tense and anxious than people who are really in the world of danger. And I watched a pathos-inducing video from Aleppo, Syria, the other day. And these kids had four or five days of no bombing. And they had, you probably all saw this, they created these little um, amusement parks out on the street. And these kids are laughing and happy and beautiful and radiant with life in the middle of a battlefield. They knew more about real life than anyone in this room. That's living. We are in a battle, in a sense, with our own uh, fear of otherness, with our own hostility to the alienation of being. That's what we're here doing. What we need to do is stand up. And the real battle is not to battle against, it's to open to. To allow all of this crazy mush of our lives to just be. And not to understand it, because you won't, but to allow it to happen and then settle in quietly and feel that expansive space of love from which it all emerged into manifested form. Be that which is unmanifest. Be the vastness of you. Feel the love that comes from the core of this. And no matter what your issues are, no matter how much difficulty is going on in your life and in your family, you will feel this incredible Teflon-like quality to your life that is so beautiful and so loving and so wonderful. It's so wonderful. You know, I went to see a production of, of my play, Ghost. It was done at Amateur, my first amateur production. And oh my God, did they make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> interpretations that I thought were like, what? Where did, where, what? But first, I learned, I learned from it. I learned so much from it. It was really amazing, and it will help me fix the script so when it goes to other groups, they'll be able to maybe imagine it a little more fully. Um, performances were sweet and endearing. The love that they were putting out was real, and the audience loved it. The audience loved it. That's all I knew. And it was like, here's a story that can be done really imperfectly and still, <laughs> still carry its kind of message, which is a simple message. The love inside, you take it with you. That's its message. And, and I learned, and I loved being there, and I had brought my whole family to see it, and they gave us nice seats, and we all watched the show. And they asked me to talk afterward, and it was, there were a lot of people who stayed for the talk, and it was wonderful to share, kind of try to, to do what I do with you, just talk something that has content. And you can feel when the content gets through, even when people aren't there for that kind of content. <coughs> and that was beautiful. And then I went with, to visit my friend David, um, old friend from college, who I love deeply, but we don't see each other very much. And when we're together, it's one of those things that I think all of you know about, where you have certain friends who Years can go by when you're back together, you're right where you always were. You're right in that wonderful space of connectivity. That's what I'm talking about in life. That connectivity is love. There is no otherness in it, really. I mean, of course there's otherness. You know, David took me to his house, and, I, and I, I'd never actually been there in Atlanta. And I walked in the doors, and I went, I said, David, if I could have walked into your brain, which I always wanted to do, mm -hmm. this is what it would look like. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was the most idiosyncratic house you've ever seen. And it was lovely. It was so totally him. There were no pieces of furniture alike. There was an a organ. There was pianos everywhere. There, I mean, it, it was like unbelievably strange kind of space, but it was where I would want to live because it was so fully embodied and so represented this person who I care about enormously. And we had a wonderful time. And then his son, who I've known for years, but much younger, was there caring for his dad who had had open heart surgery. And it turns out his son had what would be called an awakening without much of a language for it. And I said, oh, that's why I'm here. And he drove me to the airport two nights ago. And we had this amazing talk, this amazing talk. And it's not a talk unlike the talk we're having right now. But it was like, how did this happen? And how did this kid awaken? Where did that come from? Why would that happen? And he didn't have a vocabulary for it. It just wasn't part of his existence. And I was like, wow. And, and, I, and I, just, I just felt what I would call promise. The promise of the universe. To bring people into the being of this universe and let them wake up to it. Let them wake up to the front lines that they're on. And he had done that. And it was like, I felt so privileged to be watching how this is unfolding. And I <clears throat> was walking with my sister. We walked a lot. She walks more than I do. And we were walking by this car, and people were getting out of the car. And this little kid came out of the car, maybe two years old. And I looked at him, and I said, oh, God, an angel, an angel, just came out of that car. And I went, I've said this, I think, here before, but if I haven't, it's something I'm feeling. Angels are being born into the world. They're coming here because, well, we all know the world needs it. Two, they're free of the old ideas that we ever had about life on the planet. They're here in this point in time, in this moment, and they're here to help us get through the kind of difficulties that are either here now or will be coming in the future. But we're, angels are being born. People are awakening. You guys are sitting here. The love that's happening in this room is like beyond any kind of normal understanding because we are all bathing in the same pool of love and open to one another and not afraid of each other. I mean, look, if we lived in the same room, we would all be having a hard time. You know, that's really how it works. We would have to negotiate relationships a lot. But the one thing that works is if we could just sit still once a day, we would find that negotiation is not as difficult as it would be if we didn't have that connectivity. The joy of stillness, the joy of spiritual practice, the joy of entering into the battlefield with this moment, and God knows battlefield sounds strange, but it really is. Let me tell you, I know this is running on and on, but what the battle is really is with your mind and yourself and your preconceptions and your desires and your wishes and everything your ego is about. The battle on the front line is you and your ego. That's all it is. And what's going to happen? I will promise you, your ego is going to get beaten to a pulp, and ultimately you're going to go, I surrender, and the battle is over. You won't have lost, you'll have won. That's how it works. So if you want to engage the battle, let go of your ego, show up every second. Don't be a weekend warrior. Be someone who is engaged in this moment. Active duty. This is active duty. Be here and do battle with otherness, which is basically your own ego mind. You'll come out a winner and you will find yourself free of all the stuff that gets in the way and you will be truly a vessel of pure love and people will lick you like ice cream. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I wanted to confirm that angels are definitely being born. Um, I had the blessing of working in um, a kindergarten with um, a little boy who has cerebral palsy and he's in a wheelchair and um, his problems talking and singing. And he himself is an angel and just wants to hug and kiss all the time. But not only that, the children in that kindergarten, I take him out of his chair and lay him on the ground and he rolls around and all the children come over and hug 
and kiss him. Mm. And I feel like I'm in a love fest. I feel like I'm here. And I told the teacher, I said, your classroom gives me hope for the future. They're, they are. They're just angels. I, well, I mean, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, I'm not trying to, I, I don't know that we should get to Hollywood about this, because God knows how it all really plays out. But I do know it doesn't take a lot of it doesn't take a lot of angelic presence to spread. And when you see it, you know it. And it's there. I, you know, I, I don't know the end, if there's an end. I don't know. I have no idea how this all plays out, really. I just do know if you can find your way into this moment, you will find something that transcends beginning and end and as perfect as it is. That's what you will find. That may be as close as we come to a Hollywood ending. This moment is the Hollywood ending. If you find yourself present, it doesn't get better. It just doesn't. There's nothing more at all. This is it. I, I heard another student and somebody that teaches also uh, this practice say, many are called but few answer. And so it's kind of a silly question. I almost hate to ask it, but in your practice, how many of your students and what makes it possible that they do or or how they go um, that they that they do ascend or transcend you know if some a few have have experienced a kind of um, what we call an awakening I'm even uh, even the labeling of that feels uncomfortable to me even when I use it you know because it's it gives everybody an idea that there's something to get or have happen it's already happening, and you're already there. I mean, that's the bizarreness of it. The idea that you're going to have it and get it is completely an anomaly because there's no you to have it or get it. There's just the gradual or, or maybe quick, sudden loss of the self that is trying to have it, which is ego mind. Once you get rid of ego mind, you, you realize it's always been there. It's always there. It's just this thing that got created, and not by mistake. Your ego mind is not a mistaken entity. It's created for a reason, and I, I've talked about it a lot here. It's part of the, the manifested world to help manifest things in the manifested world. But it's a temporary creation, and it causes suffering. It causes suffering because everything is has beginning, middle, and an end. And everything that you want is going to get destroyed, and everything you are is going to get lost. I mean, that's that's hard to live with. So we're all neurotic as can be because of that reality. Everyone I'm sitting with is, in my mind, present and there, at least in the moment that we're sitting. And that is really beautiful. And a lot of you are getting a taste of it. The big mistake most people make is saying, that's it, the beauty, the sweetness, the love of it, that's, that's if I don't have that all day long, I'm doing something wrong. And the message I keep trying to give people is, there is no wrong. Losing it is part of it, just like I'd say sunlight and, and darkness, you know, night and day are part of the process. Having it go away is not a loss. It's just like the sun goes away and what do you do, sit there and cry all night? You just go, oh, and you know it'll come back. This comes back when it is wanted, when it's needed, when it needs to be there, it's there. What you will evolve is a sense of trust and knowing that says, okay, or thy will be done. That's what you do. And then you realize after a while, this is it. You know, this is it. And the line I use and other people have used for centuries, even this, even this is it. When that happens for you, when you switch into that gear, you're there. It's done. It's not magical. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh, I awoke and now I am the powerful one. That's, if that happens, then you've, you haven't awoken and you're not the power. There's no powerful one. Everyone is either that or not. And in my book, everyone is that. They're just walking around in a cloud. And all I want to do is bring you into some focus. And every class, everyone in this room arises or arrives at a kind of focus. And for a moment, it's very clear. The fact that it gets lost is just patterning and habitual stuff and the mind goes back into its other kind of crazy space. I know that that doesn't mean you have lost it. It just means that, yeah, it's, it's drifted away. But it's okay. It's okay. The great thing about weekend warriors and 24-hour, seven-day-a-week active, active warriors, if you will, is that they fight to keep to keep awake. They just they're con they're really at it, really at it. And some people in this room are that, and some are getting there. 
That's all. That's that's kind of how it works. I really I don't keep a ledger. My job is not to make it happen. My job is just to sit here and make these talks, I guess, or to share the energy which which we share, and and I'm willing to do it because the universe puts me here. You know, I'm also as I've said a thousand times, just as willing not to do it. I don't need this. I really don't. I don't. I don't. I don't need it. I love it. I love it. I love being with you. But I love being with anyone, even if they don't know I'm being with them. You know, I sit with people all the time. They have no clue that I'm showing up. But I'm sitting there loving them and honoring their truth, even when it's not a truth they like. It's really, you can do that, and it makes life remarkable. Because I'm with a lot of otherness that I don't sit there in judgment of. I just go, yes, even this. And I bring it in, and I love it. And I love them. And that actually nurtures them. Because to sit somewhere and not be judged by somebody, not to be found higher or lower or lesser or other, is kind of all we want. To let people look into our souls and not go, <clears throat> you know, every one of us, for the first four inches in, is pretty, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty ugly in truth, you know. But you get past that, it starts to get beautiful. It really does. I, I can't tell you how bizarre people are. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing that gets me more than almost anything, is we are weird. You know, Rudy called this place the, the insane asylum of the solar system. And it is. And you're not, you wouldn't want to spend ten minutes with most people if it was really dealing with their surface. But the minute you get past the surface, you want to spend your life with him. You do. So that's the answer to your question. I don't have numbers for you. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't so much oh. I think something, you know, it's, there's changes and great changes happening, and it's almost like a look back. It's not like, you know, something I turned or did, but, it's, but I can see that something is really... I look at you and I know that to be true. I know it's true. That's all it is. It's, a, it's called enlightenment, meaning you get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And I don't know that there's a final enlightenment. Maybe there is. But there is a definite experience of being less burdened by you. And that's a great thing because we don't have to burden ourselves. We don't. It's just throw off one burden and another and another. You never, you can't imagine how many burdens some people have. You just finally, you call it enlightenment. Then you're going to discover these little burdens that you have that you didn't even know were there. And the people who will show them to you are the people closest to you. And you will get angry because <laughs> you don't want to see anymore. But it keeps working until it's whatever, done, perhaps. I mean, the last moment is leaving this world. And the, this, the final little attachments will show themselves. And you're going to have to do, you have to still have to be in battle mode. Just let it go, let it go, let it go. Sure. Um, you said don't be with the surface part of people. Um, how do you do that? How do you manage to... Uh, you, see, you just sit and look at the love underneath it. You look at the ocean on which they're sailing. You just embrace the larger, the, the real, it's real part of them. You know, the surface part is very temporary. And if you sit and you love the person you're with, care about them, feel for them, tell them, I really understand what you're going through. Not how to fix it. Just, I understand. That's really helpful. And they lighten up. They loosen up. And they let you in more. And then you can really understand that part. You know, everybody has depths of complication. But you go past all that and you just suddenly are floating together on the same ocean. And it's really beautiful helps them and it feels wonderful to you, you know? And it's all one ocean and it's all one you ultimately. And you feel that, you really do feel it. You know, the complexities of my own otherness are just reflected in everybody else's otherness. And if you're in the same room with me, you're, you're, the, you're a manifestation of my own otherness. And if I don't learn to love that, how am I gonna learn to do anything? You know, I love the thing in front of me, I do, that's what I work for. And days, some days I'm more effective than others, but I don't even beat myself up when I'm not good at it. I just go, couldn't do it today. And it's, you know, you just do that. 
and you get through and you have you you have a life that just speaks to you it's so vibrant and alive and living and giving it's, it's beyond understanding how big and wonderful it gets and it has nothing to do with having it has nothing to do with ownership it has nothing to do with money it has nothing to do with any of that stuff it has everything to do with just being deeply at peace with and in love with being and with your being which is everybody's being it's phenomenal that's it's a gift and why wouldn't everyone do it other than ignorance and work and warrior being a warrior it takes all of that and yes many are called few are chosen but Rudy would say and I would say it's not that you're not chosen you don't choose yourself that's really the problem only you can choose you you have to do it the idea that you are chosen leaves it in something else's hands not true you know who's deciding whether you come to class not something else you get up in the morning and go I could do this or I could do that or I could do this and that's a choice. You guys, you're responsible. You own it or you don't own it. And that's kind of how it works. And ultimately you can make a big mess of things if you choose the wrong thing over and over and over and over. You know? If you eat a gallon of ice cream every night, as much as I talk about ice cream, and I love ice cream, if you eat a gallon of ice cream every night, you're going to be in big trouble. And if you do anything repeatedly and, and, you, and you do it addictively, you're going to have a problem. You need to be measured, you need to be conscious, you need to be controlled, self-control, you need to be willing to say no, all of these things, they're really essential, they're really crucial to our evolution as a person. And you learn all that just by doing it. This is the ride. Okay? Okay. Are you, are you holding a question? No. Okay. okay. Um, uh, you know, we're not here next two weeks. Next week, L.A. Week after that is um, Big Indian, and then we'll be we'll be back here in so three weeks. And I look forward to seeing whoever shows up. Thank you.